Indi acusiam col marito safira, lo diami calci che belio d'oro, e in infamia tutto il monte gira, polinestor cancise polidoro, ultimamente ci si grida, crasso dilgi che il sai, di che sapore l'oro. Crassus, tell us, for you know, what is the taste of gold? I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman leaders and to learn all we can from their triumphs and tragedies. We follow the lead of Plutarch. This is the third and final part of the life of Marcus Crassus. A noble woman stands in the courtyard of an elegant house in Rome. She's around 50, still beautiful and dignified. She looks on as her husband readies his horse, surrounded by his attendants and friends. She has watched this man pull his family back from the brink of poverty, of annihilation, and then gradually amass untold wealth and power to go along with it. She was by his side, helping him build it every step of the way since her teenage years, And as their fortune grew, she grew as well, managing the household with skill. She raised two sons with him. But now that their position seems the most secure, now that their sons have only just come of age, he wants to put it all at risk again, at greater risk than ever before. He's marching east to lead a new war at 60 years of age, and he's taking her little boy with him. Did she try to stop her husband, to dissuade him? Or did she cheer him on? What's going on in her mind as she prepares for his long, maybe permanent absence? Her name was Tertulla, and she was the wife of Crassus. The event we're imagining happened around 54 BC, but when we left Crassus four years earlier, at the beginning of 58 BC, Nothing could have been further from his mind than some high-stakes conflict with a superpower on Rome's eastern border. How did it come to that? We'll get to that story after a quick word from our sponsors. Cicero wrote a masterwork on how to become a great orator called On the Orator. And in it, he talks about how important it was for him to learn Greek in order to perfect his Roman oratory skills, that is, his Latin skills. Learning another ancient language with an amazing literary tradition was important for him and for countless other Romans, both as a training for thinking better and as a tool for being able to write better with more flexibility and power. And for hundreds of years, great English writers and orators have had a very similar experience with our own classical foreign languages, especially Greek and Latin. If you want to cultivate and project greatness, it's a good idea to find some time someday to learn some Greek or Latin. And if you want to do that, let me recommend to you that you check out Ancient Language Institute at ancientlanguage.com. Ancient Language Institute has a wide array of online programs for learning Latin and Greek, also Biblical Hebrew, and even Anglo-Saxon. That's the epic language of Beowulf. And they have beginner, intermediate, and advanced classes with flexible class times. I know the founders, and I can tell you that Ancient Language Institute is highly mission-aligned with Cost of Glory. They exist to revolutionize the way that ancient languages are taught. Uh, They have teaching methods designed to make languages easier to learn and to make them stick better. And to give you the ability, I love this, not just to look at ancient texts and authors, but to look with them. I wish I came up with that. But that's what I try to do, to give you, in my own way here, the ability to see the world with different eyes through the eyes of the ancients. And so check them out. They have a 100% happiness guarantee program. There's details on the website, ancientlanguage.com. There's a link in the show notes. And if you do, go and learn with them. Tell them that I sent you. Registration is open now for the spring term, which runs January 7th through April 13th, 2024. And it closes December 16th. So get off the fence while you still have time. Thanks, Angel Language Institute, for sponsoring the Cost of Glory. 
You know, it's easy to get this impression of Crassus as a cold Machiavellian calculator sitting amidst piles of golden coins, shuttling figurines of Roman politicians back and forth on a giant abacus. But Crassus also invested intensely in his family. For one thing, unlike other Roman politicians of his day with their frequent divorces, and that includes even conservatives like Cato and Cicero, Crassus kept the bride of his youth for all of his life. She'd married his brother before, as a matter of fact, but then his brother died young and childless around the time of the Civil War, and Crassus married her. Her name was Tertulla, as we said, and Tertulla and Crassus had two sons. There was Marcus, the older one, who was his father's namesake. He was a good kid, hardworking. And then there was Publius. Now, Crassus made sure that both of these sons had nothing but the best for their education, On top of the usual military arts, for which they would have had top-notch trainers, both of his sons learned philosophy under Crassus's Aristotelian Greek tutor, Alexander. And having the best for Crassus didn't mean luxury, necessarily. A little bit like the Rockefellers, Crassus wanted his family to live well below their means. They only had their one family house, and it was a modest one by the standards of the Roman elite. Of their two sons, Publius, the younger one, is the favorite. There was something special about Publius. From an early age, Publius was ambitious, and he took a special interest in studying oratory. Because of his father's connections, Publius was able to apprentice with the greatest orator of the day, Cicero. He would go and watch the great man's political contests in the law courts, and then he'd get to visit with him afterwards at his home to get to dissect the case and the speeches post-game with the master player. And Cicero was also impressed with the boy's talent. When Cicero was a young man, he also sought to learn at the feet of the great speakers. And one of the men that Cicero frequented as a mentor, funny enough, was the great statesman Lucius Licinius Crassus. Lucius Licinius Crassus was a distant, maybe second or third uncle of the subject of our biography, Marcus Licinius Crassus. And you wonder if Cicero had some kind of special quasi-familial affection of his own for his mentee, young Publius, despite the occasional tussle with the father. He shared in a private letter once that he hoped Publius would end up rather more like his grandfather than his father. This grandfather was the name Publius was named after, Crassus' father. That's Publius the consul, the censor, victor over the Spaniards, Hispanicus. Cicero even cherished the occasional fantasy that Publius would emulate his distant relative, Lucius Crassus, Cicero's favorite orator. So of his two sons, it was Publius, who in 58 BC, Crassus entrusts with a very special mission. When the young man is in his early 20s, he is to accompany the new proconsul of Transalpine Gaul as he goes out to govern his province. And that was Julius Caesar. And I wish I could have heard the final words Crassus said to his son before he gave his horse a final slap and sent him trotting off to meet his new commander. Publius' destination as part of the proconsular entourage was Gaul, that is more or less modern-day France. At that time, Gaul is still mostly wild tribal lands, unconquered by the Romans. Rome did securely control a modest portion of Gaul, mostly along the Mediterranean coast in the south of France, but trouble was brewing, and Publius was likely to have a chance to prove himself useful to Caesar in the arts of war and diplomacy. Maybe Crassus reminded his son that Caesar was now their family's most important political ally, that Crassus could claim to be the one who made Caesar who he was, campaign finance, political favors, Maybe he confided to his son his still rather contrarian conviction that Caesar was destined to become Rome's next great man. Maybe he reminded Publius of the stakes. Crassus is getting a little concerned about his relationship with Caesar because Caesar and Pompey have started getting a little too friendly lately. Caesar decided that he wanted to cement ties with the other member of the triumvirate, Pompey, and so he gave his only daughter, Julia, in marriage to Pompey. And in fact, uncharacteristically for one of these political marriages, after the wedding, a budding romance was beginning to form between the aging Pompey and the sweet young Julia. And this new celebrity couple, much discussed about town, this family alliance between Crassus' arch-rival and his greatest protege, 
represents a serious threat. The relationship that they had needed now to be counterbalanced. And Crassus has two ways, mainly, of dealing with this. First, fight family with family, as we've been discussing. So Publius has a lot of pressure on him to perform, to impress Caesar with the talent of the Licinius Crassus household. And he does well. A few months after they set out for Gaul, letters start flooding Rome, telling of brilliant victories. Soon Caesar sends his own commander's war reports to be read in the Senate. The Romans are victorious over the Helvetii, who attempted to invade our province. They are victorious, too, over the arrogant Germans, namely the Suebi, thanks especially to the efforts of Rome's junior officers, among whom was the brilliant Publius Crassus, who personally rallied the cavalry and shored up the sagging Roman lines in the crucial battle in which the brave sons of Romulus whipped the barbarian back across the Rhine in ignominious flight. And the way that Caesar framed it, you could argue that Publius saved the day in that battle, or at the very least, many Roman lives. Well, when that report came in, it was a happy day for his proud father for many reasons, not least of which was the fact that he had evidence now that Caesar still rated their friendship highly, as he showed with his praise. Unfortunately, one long-standing admirer of Publius was not there to share in the young man's glory in the Senate that day, and that was the orator Cicero. Cicero, by this point, was in exile, and Crassus was not entirely innocent of this fact. This had a lot to do with the second strategy that Crassus used to counterbalance the union of Pompey and Caesar, and that was keep Pompey reeling and confused. And Cicero, who was one of Pompey's earliest and most loyal supporters, he unfortunately suffered some collateral damage in this campaign. This is because the most effective tool Crassus could find to keep Pompey wobbling happened to be Cicero's nemesis. He was a handsome young scion of a great patrician clan, a playboy named Publius Clodius Pulcare. His cognomen Pulcare even means the handsome. Clodius was just the sort of stylish young man with a troubled record that Crassus tended to attract to himself, a lot like Catiline and Caesar before. Cicero and Clodius had this long-standing feud over a trial a few years earlier. We'll explain it properly in Cicero's biography. But essentially, the two men had been friends. But when Clodius was on trial, Cicero gave testimony that ruined Clodius' alibi. And Cicero expected that Clodius would be convicted and sent into exile, and it wouldn't be a problem for him. But then Crassus bribed the jury and saved Clodius' career. And that was in 61, and by 58, where we are in the story, Clodius has become an alarmingly powerful populist politician, even a sort of slumlord. And he succeeds in the year 58 in becoming tribune of the plebs, to Cicero's horror. Now, you might remember that in the Catalinarian conspiracy, Cicero, as consul, put to death the conspirators on the Senate's recommendation, but without trial. Well, Clodius' tribune now drafts a law that any Roman who puts another Roman citizen to death without a trial, or anyone who has ever done such an atrocious and unpatriotic thing, should be sent into exile. And the name wasn't specified, but nobody doubted who the intended victim of the law was, and that was Cicero. Now, even though Cicero and Crassus are on friendly terms, Crassus isn't Cicero's patron. That would be Pompey. And Cicero has always been Pompey's greatest spokesman in the Senate. So naturally, when Clodius is trying to drive him into exile, Cicero goes to Pompey's mansion to plead with the great man to protect him from this bloodthirsty mobster. But Cicero is informed by the doorman that the conqueror is not able to see him today due to the fact of his being not at home. And that was when Cicero realized his support had collapsed. And so he flees to Greece before Clodius' anti-Cicero law even passes, which it soon does after that. Clodius organizes a mob, and they burn Cicero's house down. The funny thing is, Pompey was as surprised as Cicero was about how events ended up turning out. So what happened? Once again, 
Crassus was behind the scenes, playing the puppet master. You might remember that in the year of Caesar's consulship, when the triumvirate was forged, and the three men were all steering Roman politics to their own advantage, violently overriding the wishes of the conservatives in the Senate, when that year Pompey's reputation suffered immensely, and Cicero blamed Caesar for most of all this overriding of the Constitution and for the fall of Pompey's reputation. And once Caesar left for Gaul, Cicero started criticizing Caesar in public. At first it was casual, and then he got more bold. Perhaps he was trying to restore his patron's status in the public eye, or at least his own, which was a little tarnished by association. But Caesar has his agents in the city, and they're paying careful attention to everything that went on in the Senate and in the assemblies and even at private events. And Caesar is starting to get annoyed at Cicero for being a thorn in his side. And at this point, Crassus sees the billiards perfectly positioned on the pool table, and he can sink two with a single stroke. Because when Julius Caesar hears that Clodius is on a rampage against Cicero, who he's annoyed at, he writes to Pompey to encourage him to stand down and let the exile happen. And so Pompey finds himself in the very awkward position of being forced to choose between, on the one hand, a trusty client, Cicero, even a good friend, and on the other, a relative, a father-in-law. And the bewildered Pompey at this point knows for a fact that Clodius would never have pounced on Cicero, and Pompey would never have been faced with such a dilemma if Clodius hadn't gotten the green light from his own patron and chief financier, Crassus. And in this miserable event of Cicero's exile, Caesar wins because his slanderer gets a mighty slap on the wrist. Crassus wins. His client Clodius is victorious and empowered. And Pompey loses. And the cohesion of the triumvirate seems like it's starting to fray to the advantage of Crassus. For one thing, in the wake of Cicero's exile, Pompey looks weaker than ever. After all, the Senate and even many of the common folk really love Cicero, and they regard Pompey as the betrayer of a good man. Was Pompey powerless, or was he just a bad friend? Does it matter? Well, now Clodius smells blood in the water, and he starts to get even more aggressive. He starts to turn his sights on Pompey himself. Mobs begin heckling Pompey in public every time he speaks. As Pompey walks through the city, he sees thugs in dark corners just staring at him threateningly. One day, one of them accidentally drops a dagger in Pompey's presence, and Pompey just loses it. Then he dashes to his house and he bolts the door. It's starting to look like Clodius is the next Gaius Gracchus or maybe the next Catiline. He's running the streets of Rome with intimidation and mob violence, and Pompey just knows that Crassus is behind it all, but there's no hard proof. And even if he were to speak up about it, he would get laughed at around town and pilloried in the Senate by Crassus's supporters. And anyway, he and Crassus are still good friends, right? They certainly act like it in public. Well, instead of trying the direct route, Pompey decides to back his own mobster, a former soldier of his named Milo. But that's not enough. And eventually Pompey decides he's losing control of the narrative with his long-standing master of public relations absent. He's just got to bring Cicero back. And he starts making statements to that effect. Caesar, off in Gaul, by this time he doesn't care. Cicero already got his slap on the wrist. And, to Pompey's surprise, Crassus, amazingly, proclaims that Cicero's recall is a great idea. And so the two friends, they affect Cicero's recall from exile. They orchestrate a big public vote. And what do you know? Crassus is one of the guys there waiting at the city gate to greet Cicero when he returns, 16 months after he left the city. And after that, Crassus even joins Cicero on the defense team in a few political trials where Clodius and his friends are serving for the prosecution. So Crassus in these court cases is on opposite sides from the man that Pompey regards as Crassus's bulldog in the streets. Pompey's head is spinning, Suddenly, Crassus is the face of law and order against the mobster Clodius. It boggled the mind.
until at this point in 57, a great military campaign in the East is far from Crassus' thoughts. The most important and high-stakes struggle is the political proxy war he's fighting at home with Pompey. But this domestic tension is in fact what ends up producing the great unforeseen opportunity for late glory Crassus ended up taking. And here's how it happens. With Cicero back now, and Pompey gaining a little confidence, Crassus's young friend Clodius doesn't back down at all. He just goes on a recruiting spree. And the arms race here between him and Milo just escalates. They're battling for mob control over the city's public spaces, and also for the swing votes in the popular voting assemblies. And all this time, the tensions between the two old rivals, Pompey and Crassus, start to increase. Each of them are backing their own mobster with varying degrees of secrecy and openness. And Pompey even confides to Cicero one day that not only is he absolutely certain Crassus is funding Clodius, and Clodius is even bragging about this in public, but Pompey even has it from a reliable source that Crassus is plotting to kill him. Well, that's silly, don't you think? Pompey was always a little bit excitable when it came to the subject of Crassus. But it's tense. And this mimetic rivalry between the two of them is starting to focus around some more concrete objectives. In particular, there is a certain Greek king of Egypt living in exile in Rome. The Macedonian Greeks were the rulers of Egypt since the days of Alexander. Well, this king's name is Ptolemy the Twelfth, better known by his nickname, Ptolemy the Piper, Aulites. He was called this because he was apparently really good at playing the flute, the aulos. And this is not something that a king usually wants to be known for, but Ptolemy is really beyond being ashamed of anything at this point in his life. Egypt was still nominally independent, but for many years its rulers have been basically paying bribes to various Roman politicians to keep themselves on the throne. And Ptolemy was one of the most egregious bribers of this sort. But he grew so fat and corrupt and so hated by his subjects that one of his daughters seized the throne in a coup and drove him from Egypt. The other daughter, as a matter of fact, stuck with him, and that was the famous Cleopatra, which is a story for another day. Well, now Ptolemy is promising big sums to whichever Roman would take on a quasi-military, quasi-diplomatic mission to reinstall him to his ancestral royal dignity in Alexandria. And this promises to be a very dirty, embarrassing, easy, and fabulously lucrative job for any Roman magistrate willing and able to pull it off. Egypt was legendary for its wealth and its luxury and its soft inhabitants, and whatever Roman was in charge of resettling it would just have limitless opportunity for profit there. Now, I said that the job was easy, and the job itself was, but the hard part was getting it assigned to you. Pompey and Crassus both want it. But foreign policy is traditionally the prerogative of the Senate of Rome, and the conservatives there are extremely jealous of letting either of these guys handle the task. Clodius, characteristically, is offering to help sponsor the nuclear option and organize a plebiscite to simply override the Senate. At one point, he turns a political trial, where Pompey is present, into a publicity stunt for his patron Crassus. While speaking for the prosecution, Clodius goes way off topic, and he starts a little call and response with a mob of his clackers in the audience. And he says, Who's starving the people to death? Pompey, the call comes. Who wants to go to Alexandria? Pompey. Who do you want to go? Crassus. Pompey was in charge of the grain distribution of that time. That's what he's referring to with that who's starving the people to death. But be that as it may, with this publicity stunt, a plebiscite like Clodius is kind of hinting at is extremely risky. Not least because Pompey controls a large block of voters himself. So for many months, the issue just stands at a stalemate. But then Crassus sees an opportunity to break the gridlock. It's 56, and Caesar's conservative, optimate enemies in the Senate are seeing the infighting between Crassus and Pompey as a chance 
to strike at Caesar while he's away from town, off in his province. One of the leading members of the conservatives in the Senate is Domitius Ahenobarbus, which means Iron Beard. It's a great name. He's one of Caesar's most determined haters, and he's announcing a run for the consulship for the year 55. Domitius is promising to remove Caesar from his command in Gaul and drag him back to Rome to stand trial for his crimes against the Constitution as consul in 59. Domitius' strongest backer in the election is Cato the Younger, Caesar's arch-nemesis. Well, all of a sudden, Caesar seems to be in great need. And Pompey is clearly in great need, I think you would say. Crassus, too, has something he wants. So, it's not unlike a few years earlier, when a momentous deal was struck. Crassus sends a letter to Caesar. He requests an opportunity to discuss with Caesar a matter of utmost importance in person. And the two meet across the Rubicon in northern Italy at Ravenna. At their private conference in Ravenna, Crassus and Caesar discuss plans to renew the triumvirate once again. And they decide to invite an exasperated Pompey to rendezvous with them in a few weeks after that at Lucca in Tuscany to seal the deal. Pompey accepts. The meetings between the three great men were private. But all the same, some 200 senators got wind of it and showed up in town. Proud men like Cato, Domitius, and Cicero stayed home. But others came. They weren't embarrassed to admit that at this point, the place where the most important discussions about the Republic's affairs were happening was not in the Senate at Rome, but behind the closed doors at Lucca. And years afterwards, this event at Lucca was being discussed as one of the final blows to the Republic. But at first, most Romans could only dimly see its significance. After their talk, Caesar himself quickly returned to Gaul and the other two men came back to Rome and the rumors started to fly around. What had the great men decided on? Which of their cronies would win the elections? Whose pet laws would get rammed through in demagogic assemblies? To those who had a feel for these sort of things, it was clear enough what would happen next. The consul Marcellinus, one of the leading optimates, he tries to confirm the rumors. In an assembly in the forum one day, he asks Pompey and Crassus bluntly, do they plan to run for the consulship for the year of 55? And Pompey says, I may be a candidate, I may not be. And Crassus, after a pause, he speaks up with slightly more nuance. I will take whichever course will be the most advantageous to the Republic, he says. And everyone knew it at that point. The three men had agreed that Pompey and Crassus would take the consulship for the year 55, because they were, of course, confident that they had the power to decide these things now. And besides the bribery and intimidation that were now a regular part of Roman elections and that they would avail themselves of in due course, Pompey and Crassus also secure a special delay in the date of the election to give Caesar time to do his own part. And his own part was to send back a massive wave of his own soldiers from the front lines to be present in Rome, to vote in person, as you had to. And this alone was going to ensure that it was practically impossible for anyone else to win. Crassus and Pompey, though, they took a few extra steps, just for good measure. On the day of the election for the consulship, whereas all of the other candidates have thrown up their hands and decided to drop their candidacies, Domitius Hyeno Barbus makes his way to the polling grounds on the campus Martius, accompanied by his chief supporter, Cato. And they set out well before dawn, in fact. They thought it might be very likely that someone might try to stop them. But they didn't leave early enough. Because on their way, in the dark of night, they find a band of armed men waiting for them right on their route. Thugs beat up Domitius' attendants. They beat up Cato himself. And Domitius' torchbearer gets killed in the fray, even, and so the two politicians retreat to their homes to commiserate with each other about the pitiful demise of Roman liberty. Meanwhile, Pompey and Crassus are once again elected as consuls, 15 years after they've done it once already. They waste no time 
and they make use of the tool that they reinstated 15 years earlier against the better advice of the dead dictator Sulla. As one of their first acts, they procure an eager tribune, Trebonius was his name, and he proposes a law designating the foreign provinces the consuls will receive to govern after their terms of office. And this was crossing that political red line, because remember, assigning governorships, well, that falls under foreign policy, and that's traditionally the Senate's prerogative. But by now, Pompey and Crassus have judged that it just wasn't worth the hassle to run the idea by the Senate and have to listen to Cato's endless tirades. Well, the foreign provinces that are designated in this tribune's law show that even though at Lucca, the three great men met as equals, theoretically, Crassus was the one who had the upper hand in the negotiations. Because while Pompey would get command of Spain and additionally the right to administer his province in absentia, that would give him some time to spend at home with his lovely bride, Crassus was to receive as his province Syria. Syria, just a short step away from the greatest prize of all, Egypt. On top of that, most importantly, each provincial command was to last a jaw-dropping five years instead of the usual one year. Of course, the precedent had already been set with Caesar's five-year command in Gaul in 59. And on top of this law, Pompey and Crassus also have to hold up their end of the bargain with Caesar. And so they get the same Trebonius, once again, to propose a tribunary law Another law, extending Caesar's command in Gaul another five years. And between the three of them, they control enough votes to basically use the tribunary office as a political trump card, as usual, the popular plebiscite. But this doesn't mean it's going to be easy to use it. Because Cato is dusting off his playbook from the year 59, and he's psyching himself up to become an even more spectacular loser this year. By this point, Cato has just run for the praetorship, but Pompey and Crassus did everything they could to prevent him from winning, and that included, in the end, physically blocking Cato's supporters from the voting grounds. And Cato lost, but he made sure the entire city knew why. And as his next move, when the days for the assemblies come, that they're going to discuss the two laws that Crassus and Pompey want passed, Cato and his buddies get up, and they filibuster. Cato holds forth for two straight hours until at last he's forcibly removed from the rostra. And then he pushes his way back up again to the podium like a rugby player through the crowd, and he goes on haranguing the people about the tyranny of Rome's three dynasts until the sun sets. Then things have gotten so rough that before the second day of assembly discussion about these laws, one of Cato's friends decides to sleep in the Senate House overnight so that the triumvirate's thugs can't keep him out of the forum for the action on the next day. The Curia is the name of the Senate House, and it's right there on the forum. And so he's sleeping in there, but he wakes up the next day to find that a few of Caesar's soldiers have just locked the doors of the Curia from the outside. Well, later in the day, things get so heated that Crassus himself winds up and punches a senator in the face and drives him bleeding from the forum. It was ugly, but the laws did pass. But a great military expedition to Mesopotamia, even by the beginning of 55, it's still not on Crassus's mind. But then not too long into the spring of their consular year, which so far has been brilliantly successful, Crassus gets shocking news. The current Roman governor of Syria, Aulus Gabinius was his name, he's gone rogue. The whole point of Crassus negotiating at that Luca conference to get Syria for his governorship the next year is that he'll be the one to reinstall Ptolemy. And in return, he'll call Clodius's mobs off of Pompey, But arrogant Gabinius, Gabinius, who was one of Pompey's closest associates, saw the chance to get rich before his time was up as governor of Syria. And so he went and fetched Ptolemy himself. And he took the king and he marched a provincial army from Syria into Egypt, easily overwhelms the border guards, and he installs Ptolemy back on his throne in Alexandria. The deed is done. Crassus is livid. 
Pompey steps in to try to do some damage control with Crassus in Rome. Gabinius is Pompey's man, and, you know, he feels kind of responsible. And we don't know exactly what happened or what was said, but somehow something clicked in Crassus' deep mind. Crassus has spent a lifetime building perhaps Rome's most successful political career ever at that point. But he hasn't built it on the charisma of military glory. He'd had plenty of that in his youth, yes. But the foundation that he laid for his great edifice was something much more secure, hard assets. The securities that he dealt in and amassed were much more predictable and resilient to the whims of fortune than battle with its prestige and plunder. On a campaign, a commander could just as easily be brought down by a stray arrow or a case of dysentery as by an actual military defeat. And yet, lately in his thoughts, Crassus was beginning to look toward the end. He was 60 years old. One day in a public speech, he casually remarked on the fact that not a single one of a long line of Licinius Crassuses had ever lived past 60. And so Crassus is maybe starting to look toward his legacy Maybe it was because Publius was back in town. Publius, the favorite son. In fact, the man who Caesar appointed to lead the huge contingent of swing vote troops back to Rome from Gaul as part of the deal that they struck at Lucca was none other than Publius Crassus. This is a big gesture because Publius wasn't just another dispensable blue blood factotum, the kind you might find crowding the tent of a typical Roman commander. He's not even 30 years old, and he's already a decorated war hero. In Gaul, Caesar appointed Publius to lead a special mission to the north coast. He stormed through Normandy and Brittany. He made wars and treaties with the feral Celtic chieftains along the English Channel. He managed a hostage crisis in Armorica. Caesar sent him again southwest. Publius conquered Aquitania. And there in Aquitania, he was fighting not just some chaotic clump of sheepskinned brawlers, but a disciplined Roman-style fighting force. These were remnants from Sertorius's old Spanish officer corps who took refuge in Aquitania and set up their own principalities. Then Publius broke their lines in the name of Caesar. Take the sternest Roman paterfamilias from any era you like. Which of them wouldn't be proud to be fathers of a son like Publius? Crassus has spent his whole career cultivating and investing in stylish young men of rare talent and promise. And here was one of the finest he had ever seen, growing in his own garden. Caesar's writings back to Crassus, back to the whole Senate, about Publius, they made it clear that Caesar agreed. Publius had a bright future. Then Cicero concurred. And Crassus was just on the verge of sending his other son, Marcus, to join Caesar's campaign, too. Imagine what these two brothers could accomplish together. How would Crassus' own career have gone if he'd been able to rely on the help of talented brothers like the Metelli could, like Cicero could, like Clodius could, and the great Scipios and so many others? So maybe it was Pompey, in the wake of the unfortunate misunderstanding about Egypt, who pointed out to Crassus that the real prize, after all, for the incoming governor of Syria was not Egypt, which the Romans already owned, didn't they, in everything but name, but rather it was that unconquered people just beyond their own sphere of influence. Maybe, though, as Cicero thought, it was Publius himself who pointed out to his father that the real prize to seize for him was a victory over the Parthians. The Parthians a little understood by the Romans, new Persianate people now lapping at Rome's oriental edges. Who were they? Well, Alexander the Great conquered Mesopotamia and Persia in the name of the Macedonian Greeks. The Seleucid dynasty of Greek monarchs succeeded Alexander, and they ruled there for nearly two centuries. But a decade or so before Crassus' birth, the Parthians had taken these regions back. They came from the eastern steppes beyond the Caspian Sea, and they now ruled all of Persia and much more. The Parthians had a capital in modern Iraq, Ctesiphon, which is an old Persian capital, and it was next to the old Seleucid royal seat called Seleucia. These are very close to each other near Baghdad today. And as Publius might easily have pointed out to his father, 
say as they conversed around the table after dinner one night. Even Pompey contemplated invading the Parthian lands in Mesopotamia. That was after he defeated King Tigranes of Armenia on his great eastern conquest. Armenia was the Parthian's neighbor to the north, who was allied with Parthia at the time. But Pompey's attention was distracted with easier prizes along the west Syrian coast, places like Judea. And as a matter of fact, you might point out that Gabinius himself was just about to exploit a chance to intervene in Parthian affairs when he got distracted by the quick win opportunity of reinstalling King Ptolemy in Egypt. Gabinius's rationale, like the rationale of any Roman looking at the situation, was, well, the Parthian king had just been murdered by his two sons, and these sons began a civil war with each other. One of them got ousted, fled to Gabinius for refuge. It was pretty textbook, really. All that you needed to do was restore this one of the two sons on his rightful, petty throne in Mesopotamia against the other candidate, and poof, you extend the Roman sphere of influence all the way to the Persian Gulf. And you know, Crassus Sr. might not have built his career on glory, yes, but to win a triumph at last, well, wouldn't that be a legacy most noble, most Roman to pass on to his sons and his sons' sons, a legacy most worthy of the name of Licinius Crassus? And here, in his own house, he had some of the best talent in the Republic to help him with the campaign. Imagine the experience that Publius could get if he came along. Imagine how much help he could be. Imagine what it could do for his career, for the family's name, if he and Marcus were seen riding along with their father in the triumphal chariot through the grand avenues of Rome. Marcus Licinius Crassus, Parthicus, victor over the Parthians. There was also the fact to consider that by this point, Caesar has conquered nearly all of Gaul. And if Crassus wants to keep being a triumviral partner that's slightly more equal than the other two, well, he's going to need that triumphant conquest. Better take the chance while he can. Well, whatever his true reasons, Crassus makes the fateful decision to go all in on a great Parthian war. He begins to spread the word around town. He raises seven legions. He gets a letter from Caesar congratulating him and wishing the blessings of the gods upon his expedition. Caesar offers to release Publius from his duties in Gaul, and as a sign of goodwill, to send along with him a thousand Gaulish cavalry, drawn from the sons of the noblest tribes. Publius departs back to Gaul to pick them up. He'll meet his father in Syria. But before he goes, he reconciles Crassus and Cicero. They had a falling out earlier that year over the usual kinds of things, assuaging the egos of great men. The kid is a natural-born politician. And so, as his consular year winds to a close, Crassus prepares to set out from Rome. Predictably, Cato and his minions throw up all sorts of obstructionism to try to stop it from happening. They get one of their own tribunes agitated about the event, a certain Ateus Capito. Capito tries to veto Crassus's troop levy. The other tribunes overrule him. Capito announces he's received unfavorable omens about the event. Crassus ignores him. On the day of Crassus's departure from the city in early 54, Cato and Capito and their friends fill the streets with their own mob of anti-triumvirate hired hecklers. But Pompey shows up with his own retinue, and he personally escorts Crassus from the Forum. Capito shows up, however, and he attempts to impose his formal tribunician citizen's arrest. And he has his attendant shove through the crowd and physically grab Crassus as he's trying to leave the city and start hauling him off to prison. But the other tribunes claw the man off of him, and the procession continues. And finally, Ateus Capito runs up to the city gate, and he lights a cauldron. And as Crassus and his soldiers walk by, they see Capito clouded in incense, pouring a libation over the coals, head shrouded, rhythmically chanting some barely comprehensible ancient curse. That's typical optimate obstructionism theater a parade of supposedly affronted religious sensibilities, a masterful histrionic farce. 
And yet, considering what happened, it was a scene that stuck in the minds of Romans for years to come. And considering the confidence an ambitious man like Capito poured into this attempt to shame Crassus, considering all the negative press of that year, spilling over from Pompey and even now besmirching Crassus himself at last, was it possible that this time the normally cautious and canny Crassus had paid too high of a price for the honors he was preparing to seize with this Parthian expedition? Well, now it was too late to change course. The die was cast. Many ancient writers criticized Crassus for starting a war against the Parthians without proper cause, unprovoked, they say, out of pure greed. Plutarch even goes as far as to say that he was getting fantasies of being the next Alexander, dreaming of going on past Mesopotamia to conquer Persia, Bactria, India, and beyond. But if you consider the facts, I mean, look at this civil war between rival claimants to the Parthian throne, one of them asking the Romans for help. On the one hand, this is well past the typical Roman threshold for justifying military intervention. But there had also been proxy wars in the past. Armenia, Pontus, Someone from the realist school of geopolitics would say that with Rome in possession of Syria on Parthia's western border, controlling access to the Mediterranean that they were interested in, you know, a clash between these two empires was inevitable. And the Parthians had already made a few passes at Syria, as a matter of fact, a few abortive passes that they ended up calling off, but there were already tensions there, I think it's fair to say. And Crassus's plan is probably just to reinstall this ousted prince and add him to the list of Roman client kings and eastern buffer states. I mean, he doesn't have to be thinking of a whole Alexander expedition. The name of this ousted prince, by the way, is Mithridates, confusingly, but apparently this is a common name for eastern dynasts who claim Persian royal descent. Crassus has a rough start, though, as he starts his campaign. He reaches Syria with his army not entirely intact. He lost some ships while making the crossing from Italy to Greece. Cicero told the story a few years later, and I'll quote it here. When Marcus Crassus was embarking his army at Brundisium, that's the port that you leave from, from uh, Italy to reach Greece, a man who was selling Caunian figs at the harbor repeatedly cried out, Kauneas, Kauneas, referring to figs, that is. Let us say, if you will, that this was a warning to Crassus to tell him, Kawe neas, Kawe neas, that is, beware of going in Latin, and that if he had obeyed the omen, he would not have perished. End quote. It's a little fanciful, yes. And ships were often lost at these straits. King Pyrrhus lost some ships here on the crossing between Italy and Greece, for example. And yet, if you consider what happened, not just at the crossing here, but to the whole army eventually, it does make sense that as men later told the story of Crassus's expedition, they remembered or even invented evil, tragic omens bubbling up at every turn. But the bad vibes were already there from the start, weren't they? After the Tribune's Black Cauldron stunt, I mean, this sort of thing was bad for morale. Here the troops are, marching for the glory of Rome, and yet they know that the popular support for the war effort from back home had been made to seem, at least, pretty lukewarm. That's an understatement. And this was especially dangerous for new recruits, like most of his troops are. Men who didn't have that powerful emotion of love for their commander to balance out their fear and uncertainty. So once Crassus reaches his province of Syria, he wants to score some quick victories to pep up his soldiers. He crosses the Euphrates River, which is the border between Roman and Parthian territory, and he captures a few cities in northern Mesopotamia. The region he's now in is in the borderlands between Syria and Turkey now. It's east of Aleppo. This is a relatively narrow, fertile strip of rolling hills and plains between the mountains of Armenia to the north and the vast deserts of the empty quarter of Arabia to the south. It was an area already ancient back then, the western edges of historic Assyria. 
One of the cities that Crassus secured there is a city that the patriarch Abraham stopped in when he was on his way from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan. In the book of Genesis, the city is called Haran, and in Roman times it was called Cari. Well, after these few successes, it's a little late in the year, Crassus decides, let's leave some garrisons in place, hold these cities, but then retire with the main of the army back across the Euphrates, back to Syria. And Plutarch blames him here for holding back, misspending his time. Because the rival claimant to the throne that he's backing, Mithridates III, has actually by this point raised an army of his own. He's gone ahead and recaptured two key cities that are deep in south-central Mesopotamia, Babylon and Seleucia. Well, Crassus may have had good military reasons not to push forward at this point. Most of his troops are relatively new recruits, for example. He may have wanted to spend more time training them, or he may have wanted to raise funds and resupply. Or it might have been that the most important piece of the operation, the real animating force behind it, wasn't there yet. Because Crassus was still waiting for Publius to arrive with those elite cavalry reinforcements from Caesar. And Publius does arrive that winter, and soon, so does an embassy from the king of Persia himself, Herodes II. King of kings, Arshak of Persia, Mesopotamia, Media, Bactria, Hyrcania, and the eastern steppes. And the ambassador from the king has a brief message. The king's insolent brother has no just claim to the throne. If Crassus's army was sent by the Roman people, then there would be war without truce or treaty. But if Crassus had taken up arms against the wishes of his native country, as they had been informed, then the great king would take pity on old Crassus's gray hairs and allow the garrison force currently occupying his border towns to depart in peace and take Crassus with them. And to this arrogant boast, Crassus replies, I'll give you my answer in Seleucia referring here to the main military objective that he's got. And the ambassador bursts out laughing, and he points to his open hand. Oh, Crassus, hair will grow on my palm before you see Seleucia. And with that, he rides away to go inform the king that there must be war. Soon after the Parthian ambassador's visit, Crassus gets another message from some of the border town garrisons that he left in northern Mesopotamia. The enemy is in the vicinity there, raiding and harassing Roman patrols. The messengers say they barely got through with their lives. And here's Plutarch on what they said. Quote, These men had been eyewitnesses both of the numbers of the enemy and their mode of warfare when they attacked their cities, and as is usual, they exaggerated all the terrors of their report. When the men pursued, they declared, there was no escaping them. And when they fled, there was no taking them. And strange missiles are the precursors of their appearance, which pierce through every obstacle before one sees who sent them. And as for the arms and armor of their mail-clad horsemen, it is made to force its way through everything and to give way to nothing. And when the soldiers heard this, their courage ebbed away, for they had been fully persuaded that the Parthians were not different at all from the Armenians or even the Cappadocians, whom Lucullus had robbed and plundered till he was weary of it. And they had thought that the most difficult part of the war would be the long journey and the pursuit of men who would refuse to give battle. But now, contrary to their hopes, they were led to expect a struggle and great peril. End quote. And some of the officers try to approach Crassus and say, hey, maybe we should reconsider this expedition. It's starting to sound like more than we bargained for. And on top of that, the officers bring him reports from the army's seers. The omens from the sacrifices are consistently bad and inauspicious. Among these officers trying to dissuade Crassus is a moody, ambitious young quester named Gaius Cassius Longinus, or as he's been remembered by history, just Cassius for short. This is the same Cassius who would go on to lead the conspiracy of assassins who murdered Julius Caesar 10 years later. Well, Crassus ignores these jumpy cowards. 
and he resumes his war preparation. They set out in the spring to cross back over the Euphrates and resume the war. On their way, father and son take an opportunity to make a sacrifice to the great Syrian goddess Atargatus at her magnificent shrine in Hierapolis, which is a city near the river. But as they're exiting the temple in a procession, Publius trips and falls at the gate, and then his aged father falls over him. At least that was how some of the survivors of the expedition remembered that day much later. And they also remembered how, as Crassus was taking his army across the Euphrates Bridge at Zugma, thunder was heard in a clear sky, and winds whipped the faces of the soldiers with dust. And one of the general's horses spooked and toppled off the bridge, taking her groom along with her and disappearing into the waves. And they recalled, wasn't it right, that when Crassus was making a customary sacrifice to purify the army, and the seer came to the part of the ritual where he placed the animal's entrails in the general's hands, that Crassus accidentally let the entrails fall to the ground. And to the distressed bystanders, Crassus joked, Ha! Such is old age. But be sure, you will see no weapon escape these hands. And it was said that Crassus, who was already quite old for a man of those times at age 61, that he looked even older than he was. Well, as soon as they cross the river, Crassus sends out scouts, and the men come back from their expeditions with odd reports. The rolling plains of Osroini appear to be empty. Well, not entirely. They kept coming on tracks of many horses that seemed to have wheeled around and run away. It's starting to look like the typical steppe barbarian strategy that Lucullus and Pompey saw in the east, where the biggest challenge was simply pinning down an army willing to fight and settle things. Crassus then is faced with a choice. He can follow the Euphrates River south all the way to Seleucia, 400 miles downstream, but this will risk him being encircled and having his supply chains cut off as they get stretched out longer and thinner. Plus, the Parthians, by now, have recaptured Seleucia from that pretender that Crassus has been supporting, which means no friendly forces will be waiting for him there. So that's option one. Option two is to just hole up in the cities that he's already captured, which are on the hills nearby to the north, and he can wait there and figure out more about the enemy's army and their intentions and their disposition through sending out missions. But then there's a third option. He's just gotten intelligence that the Parthians have actually divided their forces. The king himself has gone north into Armenia with a large part of the army, with one part, and he's waging a war against the kingdom of Armenia, Armenia earlier was offering to support their new ally, Rome, and King Orodes was busy punishing them for it. But the king sent another force to hold out the Romans, to hold them off until he returns from Armenia. And so the third option is to go straight ahead and find this other force. Cassus has a chance to fight the Parthians before they can reunite their grand army. But to handle Crassus, the king sent no ordinary man. It was a noble named Serena. Here's Plutarch's description. In wealth, birth, and reputation, Serena stood next to the king, while in valor and ability, he was the foremost Parthian of his time, besides having no equal in stature and personal beauty, so he's very tall and handsome. He used to travel on private business with a baggage train of a thousand camels and was followed by two hundred wagons for his concubines. End quote. And Serena was not even 30 years old yet. Another stylish young man. Now, the person feeding Crassus this information about the king splitting his armies, which is true, it was a certain Arab chieftain who befriended Pompey in the past when Pompey was in the neighborhood. And this chieftain also stated that in his expert opinion, the best option was to strike out into the plains and to try to draw Serena into a battle as quickly as possible. Option three. And young Gaius Cassius, the junior officer, later claimed that he personally advocated options one or two. 
he claimed that the Arab was a spy and that he was tricking Crassus. And he said that he tried to warn Crassus. The Parthians are renowned horsemen. The plains are going to play to their strength, stick to the hills or to confined territory. But Crassus had reasons to be confident in his own cavalry, didn't he? And he had 4,000 of them, including some of the finest riders in Gaul, led by his own son. And so with these cavalry and the 35,000 infantry that he has, he sets out from the river into the plains to find the enemy. And his Arab advisor soon made some excuse and disappeared. And at this time, Crassus was roughly in the vicinity of one of his friendly forts at Carai, a good place to retire after the victory if he needed to. It was from Carai that the coming battle would eventually take its name. After many miles marching deeper into this harsh landscape, dusty plains on the edge of a great sandy desert, some of his scouts ride up. They announce they've just encountered the enemy, taken heavy casualties. The foe is coming in large force and great confidence. Crassus draws up his men into battle ranks. He's expecting that the Parthian infantry will be supported by unusually large numbers of cavalry, not unlike what the Romans have seen and defeated in Armenia before. And so Crassus forms his lines into a hollow square formation. In case the Parthians try to outflank him with a cavalry charge, he'll be able to fight with full force on both sides and in the rear as well. But he also stations his own cavalry at equal intervals around every face of the square, so no side will be unprotected from the enemy horsemen. And the army marches forward. They start looking for the enemy. It gets late into the afternoon. Finally, the Romans see the foe on the horizon. And here's Plutarch, who, like with so many of the pivotal events in ancient history, happens to be also our best source for this battle. To the surprise of the Romans, the enemy forces appeared to be neither numerous nor formidable, for Serena had veiled his main force behind his advance guard and concealed the gleam of their armor by ordering them to cover themselves with robes and skins. But when they were near the Romans and the signal was raised by their commander, First of all, they filled the plain with the sound of a deep and terrifying roar. For the Parthians do not incite themselves to battle with horns or trumpets, but they have hollow drums of distended hide covered with bronze bells, and on these they beat all at once in many quarters. And the instruments give forth a low and dismal tone, a blend of a wild beast's roar and harsh thunder peal. And Plutarch makes an interesting comment here. They had rightly judged that of all the senses, hearing is the one most apt to confound the soul, soonest rouses its emotions, and most effectively unseats the judgment. End quote. And Crassus has got to keep his cool here. He's expecting some heavy archer fire, followed by a cavalry charge. But he spent a year disciplining these troops. They'll do the tortoise formation, the testudo, shields in the front, shields above. This will ward off the arrows. And then once the infantry engagement begins, the Romans will start grinding through. Nobody can match Roman infantry. But the arrows don't come right away. Here's what happens next, as Plutarch tells it. Quote, While the Romans were in consternation at this din, suddenly their enemies dropped the coverings of their armor and were seen to be themselves blazing in helmets and breastplates, their Margianian steel glittering keen and bright and their horses clad in plates of bronze and steel. Margiana is a region of what's now eastern Turkmenistan. It's centered around the oasis of Merv. It was famous for its metallurgy. We're going on here. Serena himself, however, was the tallest and fairest of them all. Although his effeminate beauty did not well correspond to his reputation for valor, but he was dressed more in the median fashion, with painted face and parted hair, while the rest of the Parthians still wore their hair long and bunched over their foreheads in the Scythian fashion to make themselves look formidable. End quote. And the vanguard of the Parthian forces that we're reading about here is composed of what the Greeks call cataphracts, 
That is, knights completely covered, together with their horses, in heavy plate mail, and they're equipped with long lances. So think of medieval knights jousting. And the sudden revelation of this steel as they pull their robes off, it must have been stunning in the afternoon sun. And it's a move calculated to strike fear. But when the cataphracts charge and clash, the Roman lines hold firm and the riders retreat. But as these knights retreat, the Romans realize that the Parthians have already begun riding around toward their flanks on both sides with another, much larger force of mounted troops. They stop at a considerable distance, and then the arrows came. They came and they came. These were not normal arrows, but heavy bolts with razor-sharp, strengthened metal barbs, and they were coming from an incredible distance away. The Parthians had large composite bows made not just of wood, but of bone and leather to allow far greater pull strength. The legionnaires see their shields pierced straight through, their helmets and breastplates fractured, punctured. Leather, wood, metal, nothing stands up to the arrows. The lines are shaking. They're taking heavy losses. Crassus orders his light-armed troops to make a charge to try to turn a section of the mounted horse archers to flight. But before they can get close, the riders back away and just keep shooting. Then the arrows overwhelm the light troops. The survivors retreat for safety to the legion lines. They try a couple more infantry charges to try to break the status quo, but it's the same result. Parthian horsemen outrun them and shoot them down while fleeing. And then when the Romans turn around and retreat, they shoot them some more as they turn around and chase them. Crassus keeps expecting the arrows to stop and the infantry to come. But then it slowly becomes clear there is no infantry. There will be no line-to-line hoplite clash of the sort the Romans excel at. Serena has brought a fighting force of 10,000 cavalry. A thousand are those cataphract plate mail lancers, and 9,000 of them are mounted archers, the ones currently raining down death upon the Romans. And what's more, the Romans realized to their horror, Serena has brought a thousand pack camels loaded up with nothing but arrows. They could keep shooting till the sun sets. Nothing in the Roman military intelligence book about Parthia or any eastern barbarians could have prepared Crassus for this. It had never been done before, as far as anyone knew. Crassus sends word to his son, make a cavalry charge, force an engagement. Publius rides out with his cavalry from Caesar. He takes along 4,000 infantry behind him as well, running out at a sprint. The Parthian horse archers give way and flee before his charge. He chases them out of view of the main army. They chase further and further. But then, Publius's men once again see the glint of Margianian steel growing before them. The mounted archers have fled to the cataphracts. The lancer knights charge, clash, and hold the Romans in place until another cohort of Parthian horse archers begins to gallop in circles around them, whipping up dust and sand. And finally, a tornado of arrows begins raining down upon them. Plutarch paints a chilling scene. Quote, The Romans, being crowded into a narrow compass and falling upon one another, were shot and died no easy or even speedy death. For in the agonies of convulsive pain and writhing about the arrows, they would break them off in their wounds. And then in trying to pull out by force the barbed heads which had pierced their veins and sinews, they tore and disfigured themselves the more. Thus many died and the survivors also were incapacitated for fighting. And when Publius urged them to charge the enemy's mail-clad horsemen, they showed him that their hands were riveted to their shields and their feet nailed through and through to the ground, so they were helpless either for flight or for self-defense. Publius himself accordingly cheered on his cavalry, made a vigorous charge with them, and closed with the enemy. But his struggle was an unequal one, both offensively and defensively, for his thrusting was done with small and feeble spears against breastplates of rawhide and steel, whereas the thrusts of the enemy were made with long pikes against the lightly equipped and unprotected bodies of the Gauls, since it was upon these that Publius chiefly relied. And with these he did indeed work wonders, 
For the Gauls laid hold of the long spears of the Parthians, and grappling with the men, pushed them from their horses, hard as it was to move them owing to the weight of their armor. And many of the Gauls forsook their own horses, and crawling under those of the enemy, stabbed them in the belly. These would rear up in anguish and die, trampling on riders and foemen indiscriminately mingled. End quote. Publius's men put up a brave fight, but soon they're overwhelmed. Some of Publius's advisors try to persuade him to slip away with them, make an escape to a nearby city friendly to the Romans. But Publius bids these good men farewell and encourages them to save themselves. He retreats with his remaining warriors to a small hill to make a last stand. Back at the main army, messengers come to Crassus. Publius is in difficulty. He is lost unless he receives aid quickly. Plutarch describes his state of mind. Quote, and now Crassus was prey to many conflicting emotions and no longer looked at anything with calm judgment. His fear for the whole army's safety urged him to stay put, and at the same time his yearning love for his son impelled him to grant assistance. And at last he began to move his forces forward to aid Publius. But then they hear the drums fire up again, and the battle cries and they see a new contingent of horse archers and cataphracts ride up. And one of them at the front has fixed to his lance the head of Publius Crassus for all to see. A shudder goes through the army. But it is said that Crassus in that awful hour showed more brilliant qualities than he ever had before. He went up and down the ranks of his men, crying out, Mine, O Romans, is this sorrow, and mine alone. Let the great fortune and glory of Rome abide unbroken and unconquered in you. It was not without bloody losses that Lucullus overthrew Tigranes or Scipio subdued Antiochus. Our fathers of old lost a thousand ships off Sicily before conquering the Carthaginians. Our empire was taken not by good luck, but by valor. Yet the enemy keeps circling, and the arrows keep falling, and the Romans keep getting pinned into a tighter and tighter bunch. Several more attempts prove that no amount of bravery at this point can break them out of the noose that's tightening around them. Finally, though, darkness falls. The Parthians retreat to camp nearby. They send a message to Crassus. They'll give him a night in which to bewail his son and then be back the next morning to finish their business. In the heat of the moment, you can keep your composure in the face of incredible loss, even the loss of your own child. But as the adrenaline faded and the reality sunk in, Crassus that night entered what we would call a state of shock. The Roman soldiers, even though they had nobody but him to hold responsible for the day's disaster, still they longed to see their general's face, to hear some words of encouragement from him. But there were none. He was lying on the ground, all alone, enveloped in darkness. Crassus's junior officers, Cassius and Octavius, take the initiative. There's no hope of victory tomorrow. Of the 40,000 men they began the day with, some 15 to 20,000 remain in fighting condition. Another 4,000 wounded, the rest lost, dead, or captured. They make the call to move the army at top speed immediately, and try to reach the walls of nearby Carai by dawn. They decide that the 4,000 who can't march must simply be abandoned to save the lives of the rest who are able. And the camp is soon filled with the sickening groans and shouts of the wounded and infirm as they come to realize what's happening. By the time Crassus and his army made it to Carai the next morning, all of those left behind were either captured as slaves or put out of their misery. Most of the Roman soldiers make it to the city and they try to recover their spirits. But before the main train of the army arrived, something disturbing happened. One lieutenant named Ignatius rode up to the city with 300 cavalry, shouted up to the city's garrison on the walls to tell them that there had been a great disaster, and he encouraged them to go and escort the army into the walls. And then... He just took off with his riders, abandoning the army. It was a sign of the low morale spreading through the ranks. 
Serena quickly finds out that Crassus is at Cari, and he lays siege to the city. At first, he offers a truce, but soon he demands the Romans render Crassus to him in chains. Crassus has recovered himself by now. He's not about to surrender. He makes plans to escape with the army into the mountains of Armenia by night, where the Parthians' cavalry advantage will be neutralized, and they'll be able to get away. And the Romans wait for the new moon, and it'll be darkest. And then they bust out of the city, and then they get several hours in of marching before the enemy can scramble and chase them. And the Parthians were actually famed for their complete inability to lay a proper siege to a city. There's no equipment, no earthworks, so that part's not hard, luckily. But once they're out of the gates, they split into several smaller groups and make themselves harder to capture. And as Crassus is making his escape toward the foothills that night, you wonder what thoughts occurred to him. To begin with, how bad was this disaster? Surely the campaign was salvageable? If they could get the army to Syria, 15, 20,000 men, well, he could raise the necessary reinforcements. He's got four more years in his proconsular term. There's plenty of time to recover the situation. The Romans know how the Parthians fight now. They won't be surprised again. No way. And yet, what were the risks, not just to Crassus, but to Rome itself? What if Crassus had been killed in the battle? Surely he knew that without his influence at home, keeping Pompey and the optimate nobles divided, balanced against each other, distracting the conservative senators from the man they hated much more, Julius Caesar, think about it. If Cato and his hardliner friends could reconcile with Pompey, as Pompey always dreamed they would, and Crassus had always made sure they wouldn't, well, if that happened, Caesar would be dangerously exposed far away in Gaul, and young Marcus Crassus, who was there with him, would be exposed too. What if, with Crassus gone, the Senate were to pit Rome's greatest remaining men against each other, while the whole of Rome could be exposed? Crassus had to get to Syria fast. But as day breaks... His own party of about a thousand men find themselves slowed down in some marshes in the plains. By the time Crassus extricates his men, he sees Serena and his riders coming for them. Crassus hurries his troops onto a low hill near the edge of the foothills to defend themselves. They start taking fire from the Parthians. But then they see Octavius approaching from a mile away with about 5,000 men. Octavius, his most trusty junior officer, Octavius and the other Romans arrive and they sweep the Parthians back. And then they lock shields and cover the body of their commander. They say, no Parthian missiles shall smite Crassus until they've all died fighting in his defense. Serena calls off his archers and he backs his troops away. And then the Romans see the great Parthian general, the victor of Cari, unstring his bow together with his officers and quietly, slowly ride up the incline into the space between the two armies. Serena extends his hand, and he speaks. His interpreter cries out in Greek, Today I have put your valor and power to the test against the wishes of the king. For the king now, of his own accord, shows you the mildness and friendliness of his feelings by offering to make a truce with you if you will withdraw. He's offering them safe passage out of the Parthian territory. And the Romans around Crassus are sighing with relief. They're shouting with joy. But Crassus, whose every stumble with the barbarians had been a result of their deceitfulness and thought the suddenness of their change a strange thing, he smells a trap and he begs for time to consider. Here's Plutarch. Crassus' soldiers, however, cried out and urged him to accept then fell to abusing and reviling him for putting them forward to fight men with whom he himself had not the courage to confer even when they came unarmed. At first he tried entreaties and arguments. If they would hold out for what was left of the day during the night, they could reach the mountains and rough country. Then he showed them the road there and exhorted them not to abandon hope when safety was so near. But they're not having it. They get angry they clash their weapons together, threaten him, and so he relents and decides to go. But before setting off to meet the Parthian, 
he turns to his staff officers and says, Octavius and Petronius and you other Roman commanders here present, you see that I go because I must, and you are eyewitnesses of the shameful violence I suffer. But tell the world, if you safely get home, that Crassus perished because he was deceived by the foe. Don't tell them that it was because he was delivered up to them by his own countrymen. And then Crassus walks down the hill with a few officers. A couple of half-Greeks come up from the Parthian side, and they assure him, Fear not, Serena is coming to meet you unarmed. But Crassus responds, If I had any concern about my own life, I would not be allowing myself to come into your hands. And the two parties finally meet in the space between the armies. Crassus and a few staff stand there and look up at the tallest figure among the Parthians, who are all sitting on their steeds. At last, Serena says, What's this? The Roman commander on foot? While we are mounted? This is not proper. Crassus replies, Neither is it fault, for each of us is following the custom of our own country. And that was true. The Romans prefer to negotiate on foot. But the Parthian insists, and he offers Crassus a beautiful horse with a gold-studded bridle. Crassus acquiesces. But once the groom lifts Crassus onto the horse, they give it a slap, and it starts walking. And the grooms run alongside of it, and then they strike it with their whips to quicken the horse's pace. Something's happening. Are they trying to kidnap him? To carry off Crassus to be a hostage? A slave? To stand trial? Be executed? What hubris and treachery is this? Octavius himself rushes up to grab the horse's bridle, and then another tribune joins him. The Roman officers surround the horse. They try to stop it. They drag away the grooms. Other Parthians start crowding in. A brawl breaks out. Octavius draws his sword and slays one of the Parthians. But another stabs Octavius from behind. And finally, in the chaos, one of the Parthians rips Crassus from his horse and runs him through. And so perished he who was once the richest and once the most powerful man in Rome. Some of the officers escape back to the army. They get ready for a fight. But Serena sends a messenger to them, saying, Crassus has met with his just deserts, but the rest of the Romans may surrender themselves without fear. Many do. Others escape during the night, mostly to be hunted down and killed by Serena's Arab trackers. In the whole of the campaign, of the 40,000 who set out, 20,000 are said to have died, 10,000 were taken alive, and another 10,000 escaped to tell about it. And the Battle of Cari went down as one of the worst military disasters in Roman history. Serena had Crassus's head cut off. There is one later story that he poured molten gold into the mouth of Crassus, a symbolic ex post facto execution giving Crassus what they claimed was his favorite thing. That story is preserved in Cassius Dio and Pompeius Trogus. Maybe it happened, or maybe it was a legend applied by analogy. Mithridates of Pontus, years earlier, did in fact publicly execute a greedy Roman proconsul by that means. But Plutarch records a different story. One of the most famous tragedies of the Greek poet Euripides is his Bacchant women, the Bacchae, the story of when Dionysus comes to Thebes and drives the women mad to punish the city for its faithlessness. At the climax of the play, the prince Pentheus is murdered off stage and dismembered by his own mother, Agave, in a hallucinatory rage. She then emerges onto the stage, cradling the head of her son, believing it to be that of a lion. Here's Plutarch. Quote, And it happened that King Orodes of Parthia was at last reconciled with Artavasdes, king of Armenia, and agreed to receive the Armenian sister as a wife for his son. And there were reciprocal banquets and drinking bouts at which many Greek compositions were introduced, for Orodes was well acquainted with both Greek language and literature. And Artavasdes, king of Armenia, actually composed tragedies and wrote orations and histories, some of which are preserved. Now when the head of Crassus was brought to the king's door, the tables had been removed, and a tragic actor, 
Jason of Tralles, was singing that part of the Bacchae of Euripides, where Agave is about to appear. While he was receiving his applause, Silakis, Serena's messenger, appeared in the doorway of the banquet hall, and after a low bow, he cast the head of Crassus into the center of the company. The Parthians lifted it up with clapping of hands and shouts of joy, and at the king's bidding, his servants gave Silakis a seat at the banquet. Then Jason, the actor, handed his costume of Pentheus to one of the chorus, seized the head of Crassus, and assuming the role of the frenzied agave, sang these verses as if inspired. Now from the mountain we bring a tendril fresh cut to the palace, a most blessed hunting prize. And this delighted all the guests. With such a farce as this, the expedition of Crassus is said to have closed, just like a tragedy. There are many lessons to take from the life of Marcus Licinius Crassus. Let's discuss them in the next episode. Whatever your opinion of the man, I think, for now, he deserves a little peace. If you got something out of this, please write us a review, subscribe to our newsletter at ancientlifecoach.com, or, most importantly, share the story of Crassus with a friend in need. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.